Everyone, what's up? Today I want to go over probably my favorite topic in vector calculus, at least in single variable vector calculus. So Kepler's second law, there is a really nice way in which you can prove, that, and this is an interesting debate about you know whether what I'm about to show you it's a proof or not. I have talked to my physics teacher about this being a proof. He says that it's not a proof. I, I would say it's a proof. It's an, I'm gonna show you the reasoning. Uh, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you something and it's up to you to say whether it's a proof for Kepler's second law or not. I think it is, my teacher says it's not. I wanna see what you think, okay? So this is a very nice topic. So yeah, I'm just gonna get right into it. So I wanna show first of first of all, I wanna hope I well, I don't know if you know about I don't know if you know what Kepler's second law says, but pretty much it just says that if you have a planet and a star, the planet will the planet's position vector, this is actually better with the drawing. So if you have something like this, so you're gonna have an orbit, which I'm gonna say is gonna be this arc length. Uh let's say we're gonna have a planet here. Let's say we're gonna have, this is gonna be one position vector and this is gonna be another position vector. I'm gonna call this vector uh, R. And let's say this is gonna be R plus delta R, okay? So hopefully you're comfortable with this type of notation. Uh, this is just vectors, I'm just doing a diagram here. And uh, we know we're gonna have our delta R vector here. Okay, so this will be delta R, nice. So. Kepler's second law says that the area swept by R will be swept, or how should I say it? The area swept by R will be constant in a given interval of time, okay? Meaning the ratio of the area swept by R and time will be constant, okay? So we can formulate Kepler's second law like this. The area swept, which I'm going to say is going to be 8 sub t, because really this is going to be a triangle uh, when... so. This is really, when you let delta r be very small, so when you go into an infinitesimal domain, this will be really, it won't be an arc length, but really a triangle because of local linearity, then this will be a triangle and not really an arc length, it won't be an arc. So we really have a, the area of a triangle. So I'm gonna use a sub t just to indicate that it's a triangle. Now Kepler's second law says real quick, uh, real quick, you need to know this. The area swept in a given interval of time delta t will follow or will satisfy a factor or a ratio, they will have a ratio k, okay? So there's always gonna be, you know, as time increases, as delta t grows larger, uh, the area swept by this r vector, as the planet orbits the star, this is gonna be a star, and the planet, we can just say, you know, it's gonna be here, and then it's gonna move here, you know? So the area swept by r will be, will be, will, the rate of the, of the area swept by R will be constant, okay, with respect to time. That's pretty much what Kepler's second law says. And now I wanna show to you that this is true, okay? So I will prove, or I don't know if it's a proof or not, I believe it's a proof, but this is a really interesting debate, so you let me know. But I wanna show you how you can show that this is true or consistent with experimental results from physics. That's something I really need to stress. Uh, this proof or this explanation relies on a reasoning from physics and relies on experimental results that, hell, even Kepler uh, was able to observe. He knew that, that there, hopefully you've taken a physics class before, um, you know, planets, they have a centripetal acceleration, meaning acceleration will always be pointing to the center. So really acceleration, uh, the acceleration vector will always be parallel to the position vector. So this is gonna be A, and it's gonna be a centripetal acceleration, okay? And it's gonna be a vector, okay? So that's, uh, that's an idea from physics that we need to borrow. And yeah, now let, let me get into the math now. So we wanna show that this relationship, that there is established a constant rate, ratio K between the area swept and the time elapsed. We wanna show that this is true. And the first step in doing that is being able to write A sub T in terms of something else. Now, there's a very important idea in, you know, in vector analysis, I mean, you know, in vector math, uh, that goes, if you have two vectors, I'm going to say, uh, let's just say you have A and B. Well, you can draw a parallelogram off of this. And you're going to have the same vector. This is also going to be A and this is also going to be B. The area of this parallelogram, so I'm going to do it down here. The area of this parallelogram will be equal to the cross product between A, the magnitude, sorry, the magnitude of the cross product between A and B, okay? 
Now, notice that if you split a parallelogram in half, if you do something like this, or if you make this division here, if you, see, you can either divide it this way or this way. So it doesn't matter what division you make, if you just simply split a parallelogram in half, you're gonna get the area of a triangle, okay? So then we can say that the area of a triangle is gonna be half the area of a parallelogram, meaning it's gonna be the magnitude of the cross product between the two vectors of this parallelogram, the two vectors containing this plane. Remember vectors, you can make a plane that contains two vectors. So this is really, when I say parallelogram, you can also think of it as a plane. So A and B, they're gonna be contained in a plane and the magnitude of this parallelogram, which lies in the AB plane, is gonna be, uh, sorry, the area of the triangle, uh, which is gonna be half the area of the parallelogram in the AB plane is gonna be equal to the magnitude of the normal vector of, a, of, the, of this plane, okay? Meaning A cross B. A cross B is a normal vector of this plane, okay? So this idea is very important and it's exactly this principle, this concept is what we're gonna use to rewrite A sub T, okay? So we know that if we wanna find the area of this triangle, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna clutter this with too many lines and stuff. So really we're just trying to find the area, this area, so this area given by R plus delta R, R and delta R. So we want to find the area of that triangle, and we know if you go into calculus into a calculus domain into an infinite, infinitely small interval, delta r is going to be really small, and then you're going to have a triangle. That's why we can apply this idea of finding the area of a triangle, because even though this is an arc, and Kepler's second law works for arcs and not exactly for triangles, a triangle is the same as an arc when you go when you let delta t be equal to approach zero. Okay, not be equal. Uh, approach zero, okay? Because of local linearity, you know, curves are pretty much straight lines in calculus, you know, calculus domain, okay? So now, let's rewrite A sub t. So, using this principle, well, we just simply need two vectors, A and B, the equivalence, the equivalence of A and B in this diagram to be able to find the normal vector to this plane, okay? So, another idea that I will borrow from physics so most planets, I think, I don't know, I haven't heard of any planets that don't follow this rule, but every planet orbits around a star in a plane that is not moving. So imagine my elbow is a star and the point of my finger is a, 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 a planet. The plane, so the movement of the planet with respect to the star is going to be something like this, right? It's going to orbit the, my elbow is going to orbit the star. And this planet will, this plane will never start doing this. So the plane that contains the star and the planet will never start tilting. Because then that would mean that you could find, say you have an axis that crosses half the star. So you could say you have an x-axis for the star. That means that the angle from the planet to the x-axis, uh, I can make a 3D drawing for that. Hopefully you can visualize what I'm describing. But if you have three axes, you have X, Y, Z axis for a star. If the plane in which the star and the planet are contained, if the plane was tilting, meaning the normal vector of that plane is not constant. Remember, we use normal vectors to describe how planes behave. It's a really convenient way. And if a normal vector is not constant, that means that the plane is tilting, okay? So another very important idea that we need to borrow from here is that this star, this is going to be a star, I should probably make that in blue too. It's going to be a star and it's going to be a planet, it's going to be a star and this will be P. So the plane that contains the star and the planet will not be changing, will not be tilting, okay? That's another idea that we have to borrow from physics. So now with those concepts, we're, we will rewrite this equation into something else and we will show that this is true, okay? Uh, even though we're doing circles, some, that's something I should really man, I should mention, by the way. Planets, they orbit stars in ellipses, not in circles. But um, if I wanted to prove that this works for ellipses, we would have to, we would have to go to nonlinear partial differential equations, which is kind of far away from my math knowledge. I, ha I don't know how to solve, I think, any nonlinear partial differential equation yet, or at least not with the comfort I need to be able to do so, so that I can do it in camera. So you're not gonna see this for ellipses uh, just yet, okay? But I know how to prove this for circles, okay? This is, of course, simplifying Kepler's second law, 
uh, we can show that this works even if the star is just orbiting, even if the orbit of this planet with respect to S is just a circle, okay? It's a simplification which is not real, which is not, is not really the case in real life in space, but we can do it and everything still works nice, okay? And I think it's a nice way to introduce you to Kepler's second law, okay? So you now let's rewrite A, T, A sub T. So we know we're gonna pick uh, two arbitrary vectors. In theory, you could pick R and R plus delta R, but I think it's gonna be easier, and you're gonna see why in a moment, to pick R and delta R as our A and Bs to build a parallelogram and to find the area of the triangle, okay? So I'm gonna say the following. So this is the form, this A, a divided delta T equals K. This is the form, the structure that we wanna to get to. And now let's see how we can do that. So we're gonna say that the area of this triangle, this triangle here, uh, this will be equal to, so we picked R and delta R, so it's gonna, we know it's gonna be the normal vector of the plane, that the magnitude of the normal vector of the plane that contains R and delta R, and then we're gonna divide by two, okay? Remember, we're dividing by two because if you slice a parallelogram in half, you're gonna get the area of the triangle, of a triangle in the parallelogram, okay? So we're dividing by two. Now, here, notice that in this equation we have delta t. So now you should really ask the question, well, is there any way we can include or we can insert delta t into this equation? Yes, there is. We know how to rewrite delta r in terms of delta t and velocity. Remember velocity, so I'm gonna semicolon here. Velocity, remember, is gonna be equal to our displacement vector divided by delta t, which means that we can rewrite delta r uh, as v velocity times delta t, okay? So these equations, we can use them to insert a delta t into a problem. So we're gonna have the following, we're gonna have that a sub t is gonna be equal to r cross v, and now delta t is just gonna be a constant, it's not a vector, it's a scalar, it's just simply scaling up or down the delta r and v vectors, so I'm just gonna put it outside looks better, it's better style, and then I'm gonna divide by two, okay? So these two equations, they're the same equation, just using different symbols, okay? Now, notice that if I divide both sides of the equation by delta t, well, I'm gonna get the exact form that I want, okay? Two, nice. And, and yeah, I'm gonna write k just so that it's easier to show how similar these two equations are. This is the equation that describes Kepler's second law. And this is the equation that we now have. The ratio between the area swept by the r position vector divided by nt, the ratio between these two guys, should be this value over here. Now we know two is just gonna be a half, it's just gonna be a coefficient. And now we need to ask the question. If this equation is true, meaning the ratio between a and delta t is constant, that means, that implies that r cross v, the magnitude of r cross v, meaning the normal vector of the plane containing the motion of s and p, if this normal vector has a constant magnitude, and we know it's gonna have a constant direction because of what I explained earlier, planes with stars and planets, they don't tilt, they don't, you know, they don't change the angle with respect to a horizontal axis or any axis. So we know that the direction of r cross v is gonna be constant. Now, what about the magnitude? Well, there is a really nice way in which you can verify if the magnitude of a vector changes. And really, overall, you can use this way to see if a vector is constant, okay? So, we, so here's what I'm gonna say. Kepler's second law, is consistent or is true, at least using this reasoning, Kepler's second law is true if r cross v is a constant vector. Now remember, by definition, constant vectors don't change direction. We know that's true based on physics. And then, do, does r cross v have a constant magnitude? Well, let's take a look at that. So now we're gonna say, is, now really we need to solve this question. Is, oh sorry, is r cross v constant this is the this is now where the problem lies okay we need to see if r cross v is constant now hopefully you've done some vector calculus before maybe with parametric equations and you know that if you have a vector 
and you take its derivative and you get zero, that means that the vector is not changing, okay? You can take the derivative of a vector with respect to time, and if you get zero, meaning the components that describe the vector or its derivative, if those components are zero, that means that the, the vector that comes before the derivative, meaning the antiderivative of that vector, is a constant vector, okay? Because, yeah, I just want to give you a quick example. Say you have r is going to be equal to 10 i hat plus 2 j hat minus 1 uh, minus 10 k hat, okay? If you differentiate, so if you do dr dt, well, what are you going to get? Well, all of these are constants, okay? Because r is really just going to be a constant vector. This is not, this, the components of i hat, j hat, and k hat, they're not functions, okay? So if you differentiate this, well, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get zero, okay? And now what does this mean? Well, this means that the velocity of this point or this particle in space, the velocity is zero, it's not moving at all, okay? And we're gonna use this reasoning here. If the normal vector is constant, if it's a constant vector of this form, if it just has constant i hat, constant j hat, constant k hat, then we should get zero if we differentiate that vector with respect to time, okay? So that's what I'm about to do. So now let's see. So now uh, we're gonna do, what is the derivative? of the normal vector r cross v, okay? So r vector v cross vector. Now there's a very important rule that you need to know, and that is you can take the derivative of a cross product using the common, you know, the nice and easy product rule from single variable calculus. So you can just do that, and instead of multiplying the two functions, so you have the derivative of uv, you would do u prime v plus uv prime. Instead of just multiplying, you're gonna take, you're gonna use a cross product. Okay, so let me just show you what this looks like. This is going to be equal to dr dt cross v plus uh, r cross dv dt, okay? So this is now what you get. Now, this is, uh, it may seem kind of confusing and weird. Like, why can you do that? Well, it's really just a rule, and there's actually a nice proof of it. I may upload a video on that, but you can do it. You can prove it using components. If you, if you have components and you just simply, you know, you give it some symbols and then you actually find what this normal vector is equal to, you're going to see that if you, if, you use, if you do this and then you just simply differentiate the normal vector by its components, you get the same thing in the end. So that's one way you can show this is true. But for now, just be confident that this is true, okay? This holds. And now we're going to see, well, what is this equal to? We want to see, is this equal to zero? Well, let's see. So we have dr cross v. Now dr dt, we know that's going to be velocity vector cross velocity vector plus position vector cross dv dt, that's going to be acceleration vector, okay? And I'm really going to say a sub c, okay, for centripetal acceleration. If you don't know what centripetal acceleration means, you just need to know that sun, a star is going to have a mass, therefore it's going to have gravity, it's going to, have a, it's going to create a gravitational force on this planet, and that gravitational force, it's always going to point to the center. It's going to be a center-seeking force. And centripetal just simply means center-seeking, okay? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a force that always points to the center, okay? So that's why we say A sub C. You can think of it as A center, okay? An acceleration that points to the center. Now, what is this equal to? Well, here we need to use some reasoning about cross products. So... V dot V, well, if you take the cross product of the same vector, you can have an infinite amount of normal vectors to this same vector. It's very hard to describe what you would get off of this in terms of a normal vector, and that is why it makes a lot of sense that if you take the cross product of the same vector, of a vector with itself, you're just going to get zero, okay? And really, if you do a Laplace expansion with respect to the first row using i hat, j hat, and k hat, and then you find minors of the matrix that you get for computing, you know, hopefully you compute the cross products that way. Uh, when you do that, you're gonna get zero in the end, okay? Just try out a couple of numbers and you're gonna see that the cross product of A cross A, any vector cross the same vector is gonna give you zero, okay? So then we know this will be zero. Now, what about R cross A? Well, here's where it's interesting and we're really gonna use the same reasoning. We know this will be zero. And from this, well, we're gonna have something very nice. We know R and AC, well, we know R and AC, they are parallel vectors, okay? Now, if you have two parallel vectors, 
is pretty much the same as if you had the same vector, okay? This, this vector v and v, it's, they're parallel, okay? They're both pointing to the same direction. R and A, they are the same, not the same vector really, but they're gonna be parallel in the sense that they never intersect. If you draw them, they will never intersect. One points to the other, right here, this diagram actually shows it. Since we have the same triple force, we know that AC is always gonna be pointing to the center, and we know that R, it's always gonna be pointing away from the center to wherever the planet is, okay? And we know AC, it's always AC's origin, you can think of it, think of it as the origin, it's gonna be P, and it's gonna be pointing to S, okay? Meaning R, AC, R and AC, they're gonna be parallel vectors, okay? And if you have any parallel vectors, think about it geometrically. Uh, can you have a normal vector if you have, if you have uh, parallel vectors? First of all, you cannot even create a plane off of two parallel, or if you have this, you know, like, I'm just gonna say you have this, and you have, let's say this is the origin, and you have this, Assuming uh, this is going to be minus a, uh, and let's say this is just going to be minus, and let's say we scale this, that's supposed to be a k. Or... That's a better k, yeah? So it will be uh, plus k and minus a. So you're going to have a positive one and a negative one. They may not have the same magnitude, that's why I included this k here. But they're going to be pointing to opposite directions. There is no way to build a plane you can, there's an infinite amount of planes that contain these two vectors, okay? It doesn't matter if they have the same magnitudes or not. There is no plane, no, there is no unique solution for a plane that contains these two vectors, meaning there is no normal vector, okay? Now, if there is no normal vector, that means that this term, it's also going to be zero, okay? Just simply take the cross product of, you know, the, find a vector and then multiply by negative one and then just find the cross product, okay? You're going to have this scenario here. You can think of, you know, this could be like, uh, this would be like A, C, and this would be R. They don't necessarily have the same magnitude, but they, uh, there's an angle of 180, 180 degrees between them. So the cross product is going to be zero, okay? Because R is parallel to A, C. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is very nice. This means that the derivative, so D, 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 T of R cross B, well, we know this is going to give us zero, which is exactly what we were kind of wishing for, really. <laughs> if this derivative, so if the derivative of the normal vector is zero, that means that R cross V is constant, okay? And the magnitude of any, any constant vector is always going to be constant. Now, if the magnitude of, no, yeah, I really want to, really want to say this. If, because this is true, then that means that the magnitude of r cross v is going to be constant, okay? It doesn't matter, it's going to be a number, we don't really care, but we know it's going to be constant, okay? Now, if r cross, if the magnitude of r cross v is constant, that means that you divide that by 2 and you're going to have a number that will never change as delta t changes. And that means that the ratio, then, we just show, we just proved, I want to say that it's a proof, really, we just showed that there is indeed a constant ratio this is going to be the factor by which a and the time elapsed differ by, okay? So this is the factor, this is the ratio between the area swept by R and the time elapsed, okay? And that is what Kepler's second law says. It just says that the area, the, the, in a given interval of time, there's always going to be the same amount of area swept by R. We just showed that that is true for circles. It's the same case for ellipses. There is actually a way in which you can show that the second derivative of a with respect to time is zero. And that means that if the second derivative of the area with respect to time is zero, that means that the dt has got to be a constant vector, a, a constant number, a constant value. Because if you take the derivative of a constant, you get zero, right? Hopefully you know that. So if the second derivative, uh, I like writing, so I'm going to write it. Another way for ellipses, and this is one step in the proof for ellipses, uh, the second derivative, I'm going to use this notation, I don't want to write differentials. Uh, by the way, this is Newton's notation, or the uh, dot notation. This is just so, uh, just so, yeah, I'm going to do it here. Uh, if you do dx, dt, this is the same as saying x dot, okay? And if you write two dots, that means that it's the second derivative. So, this, hopefully you're convinced that this 
is true for circles. Now, what about for ellipses? Because I know you may feel kind of bad or you, you may not accept that, well, you're using circles and planets, they really orbit in ellipses around stars. Well, for ellipses, I'm just going to give you pretty much the last step in the proof for a, for Kepler's second law in an ellipse. And the proof just says that the second derivative of time, oh, sorry, the second derivative, uh, the second time derivative of A is going to be equal to zero, meaning that A, so the derivative of A, meaning the rate of change of A with respect to time, meaning the ratio of A with respect to, the ratio of A to a, an interval of time is going to be constant, C or K or whatever, it's going to be constant. So if you differentiate a constant, again, you get zero. This is the last step in the proof for ellipses. And hopefully you can see that the reasoning is very similar. Over here, we're just taking the derivative of the area. We're showing that area, well, we're not taking, this is not taking the derivative of the area, really. This is showing that the derivative of the area is zero, okay? Meaning the second derivative of area uh, is gonna be zero, okay? So really, this is actually, uh, this is actually going to be the second derivative of area. I can think of it, think of it like that, okay? Uh, so now, uh, this is going to be a long video anyway, so I don't care about talking too much. This is a very nice topic. I really like, you know, I really like being, being able to combine centripetal acceleration and vectors and a bit of calculus. It's very nice. So here's where I had a debate with my teacher. Shout out to Mr. Amoroso if you're watching this. <laughs> um, so he says that so here's my reason. I'm going to tell you what I think. Kepler's second law can be stated using this equation, okay? This equation is what Kepler's second law says. Now, we, can, we, we just showed that this equation is the exact same equation or is the exact same idea, just simply written using different symbols, as this, okay? We showed that the, the magnitude of this normal vector will indeed be constant, okay? And we know this equation is the same as this equation. These two ideas, they are the same thing, okay? And since they are the same thing, I think it's reasonable to say that if you, if you have an idea, you can formulate it in terms of something else, and you know that something else is true, then the first, the original idea that you had should also be true, okay? I think that's a, an argument that mathematicians always make. If you have something and you can rewrite it in another form, and you know that form is true, it's mathematically consistent, then your initial assumption or idea or whatever is got to be true. Our initial idea was that there's a constant ratio k uh, between a and the time elapsed, okay? The area and the time elapsed. We said that, well, there's got to be a ratio, and we just showed that we can formulate this idea into something that is true, which is this, okay? And now you ask, well, what is the proof that this is true? The proof is this, okay? The proof is that the derivative of the normal vector of this plane, which is here, which is what it's over here, we want to show that the normal vector is constant. When you take the derivative of this, we know this will be zero. You can prove that mathematically really easy. And now you can also prove that any two parallel vectors, they're also going to give you zero. And now really, here we need to ask, how do we know that acceleration is going to be parallel to the position vector, okay? That's where we need to ask that question. And here, I would say the argument, and I guess that's why my physics teacher said that this may not necessarily be a proof. Here we, we show that R is parallel to AC based on experimental results and pretty much intuition. There is no way a planet can orbit a star if its velocity vector is not constantly being changed well, at least its direction. A planet cannot, cannot orbit a star if its velocity is not constantly changing, so that it always kind of, the, the, the changing the direction of the velocity vector, it's always gonna be the acceleration, okay? And really you can show that, uh, should I make another diagram? Yeah, we're gonna make another diagram here. Uh, if you have, uh, well, not really, I should probably make the arrow the other way. If you have two acceleration vectors, so say you have the following curve, this is going to be a velocity vector. Uh, let's say this is going to be another velocity vector. Well, uh, well, no, that doesn't really work for my example because they don't have the same magnitude. Uh, I'm going to do something like, uh, let me do this. I really want to show you what I mean. If you have something like this, yeah. So this is going to be in a very small time interval. You're going to have an acceleration vector one, and then this vector over here is going to be V2, this change here 
is gonna be this vector here is gonna be acceleration, okay? That change in in velocities, oops, that change in the velocity vector is gonna be acceleration, okay? And that just simply follows from the typical acceleration formula. It's just simply gonna be the change in well, I probably should have made it smaller because it's not necessarily, you know, you, you're gonna scale the delta v vector by delta t, okay, and you're gonna get something smaller. But my point is that in physics, we know acceleration has got to be parallel to the position vector because otherwise planets would not orbit around the sun and we have observations that show that acceleration is always gonna be center seeking. Acceleration is always gonna be pointing to the center. And well, by definition, I guess, by the most fundamental reasoning we use, we just say that R is gonna be, is gonna be pointing to wherever, the, to wherever the planet is relative to a star, okay? Yeah, in theory, I guess you could just simply pick any random point in space and, and measure R with respect to that point. But then that would be, I don't know, I mean, no one's done that before because it doesn't make sense. It's not what you would intuitively do, really, if you're trying to measure you're trying to measure how P moves relative to S. So we just simply let R go from S to P, and we know centripetal acceleration has got to go from, has got to point to the center, okay? And then they, they must be parallel, okay? And if we know that there is no way this universe works without AC being parallel to C, to R, and really I'm using parallel here in a very flexible way. Parallel means that, well, I guess parallel means that two objects never intersect. And in theory here, R and AC, they point to different directions, but they, their diagrams never intersect. That's what I mean by parallel in this case, something I want to clarify. So we know the universe wouldn't work if AC was not parallel to R. Therefore, we know this term, this term, this term, here's the core of the proof. If this term is not zero, then there is no way this vector is constant, okay? So really, you can think of it like this. If, this, if you got something for your cross product, of R and AC, if you got a if you got a vector that is you know the rate of change of the normal vector, and you, you get that it's non-zero, then this would not be true, okay? And that would not be true, for instance, if the plane was tilting, if the plane containing S and P was tilting, then that would not be true. But we know that does not happen again because of physics. We have experimental results that show you that. I can give you a couple links to some observations of that. There are observations that show that the planes don't shift. The planes don't shift. And that AC, I mean, yeah, if you've taken a physics class, you're probably convinced that AC is parallel to R. <laughs> um, and if that's true, then this is zero. I'm saying that over and over again, but this is a really interesting debate. Is this a proof for Kepler's second law or not? Please let me know. I would say it is. My teacher is more hesitant to say that it is. I totally understand his perspective. I see why the proof or the mathematical rigor may break down when we claim that R is parallel to AC. How do we know that's true? My argument is that we know that's true based on real life and based on experimental results that are consistent over and over and over again. If they are consistent over and over again, that should be as good as a mathematical proof, okay? That should be just as rigorous and therefore we should accept it as a valid argument to explain the, to, to, to consider this statement valid, okay? Because R is parallel to AC, then R plus A is going to be zero, and therefore this derivative will be zero, meaning the rate of change of A with respect to time is going to be constant. Okay, that's been my my you know my uh, my rant for today. <laughs> Hopefully, this is a very nice topic. I really like it. You got you get to use some vectors, you get to borrow some concepts uh, from physics, which is very nice. Yeah. Uh, this is probably going to be like a 30-minute video, but yeah, anyways, I don't really care. It's a nice topic, so yeah. Hopefully you liked it. Uh, you know, just send me a comment or something if you want to keep talking about this, or probably just ask for my email, I guess. I can, yeah, we can also email about this. Very nice. So yeah, that's been the entire video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. This video is longer than usual, but it doesn't really matter. It's a nice topic, and you can learn a lot of things from this, so yeah. All right, bye. Uh, yeah, see you in the following video.